Welcome back to Capturing the Intangibles, where this week we scratch the surface of the low-code and no-code phenomenon and start to explore why this trendy buzzword has entered the public lexicon, kind of like zooming someone or zooming something. We have some very special guests joining us as guides that have been at the center of the low-code and rapid app development game for years now, so let's dive in. Enjoy. Welcome to uh, to another episode of uh, Capturing the Intangibles. This week is just going to be myself, uh, Massimo, and Rick are out this week, just ahead of the holidays. But uh, as a reminder uh, for anyone that's listening at home or watching us on YouTube, love hearing feedback. I uh, love hearing new ideas for episodes, and we've been getting some comments and uh, personal feedback actually directed to, uh, to over our company email accounts as well on new types of ideas. And some of those ideas were about this whole uh, low code, no code paradigm that, you know, has kind of peaked uh, in 2020 this year. So we thought it would be a great opportunity to, to have a whole episode on really the uh, the future of low code and no code, what it is to begin with. And uh, we invited a, a team over at um, uh, of our colleagues that work exactly in this space to help us kind of understand better a little bit more about this particular area or domain of the enterprise industry. So, yeah, um, why don't you go go ahead and introduce yourself, guys? Uh, I'm Caitlin. Uh, I've worked on the Mongoose enablement team probably five, seven years, something around there. Um, uh, I've been working under Paul for a long time, and my main job is mostly helping applications either transition onto Mongoose or building out a lot of um, proof of concept. Like people will come to us with an idea, and I'll go and build it out and show them that we can do we can we can do it. Um, so a lot of my work deals with those two areas. Dave Heffler, Vice President of Product Management within Four. Um, I've been with the company nine years. I've been associated with the company for 20 something years. Uh, prior to being with Infor, I was a channel partner. Uh, we had a business in upstate New York and in Canada. And nine years ago, we ended up selling the company over to Infor, and that's how I ended up joining. Speaking of Canada, Paul, yeah. why don't you say hey? Yeah, so Paul Horn, <laughs> I'm the uh, product manager for Mongoose. So I did about 15 years in industry before uh, joining into software. I was working with um, manufacturing and distribution companies implementing systems. Um, and one of those systems just happened to be an Infor system. So I was an Infor customer in about 2001. In 2005, I joined a partner and uh, did consulting for a number of years. I don't know. And then in 2011, if this starts to sound familiar, um, I joined Infor. Uh, because we were sold into, uh, which was great, and joined development, and then eventually uh, joined Demo Services, where I met Caitlin, and uh, we eventually transitioned into becoming the Mongoose Enablement Team in 2015, and uh, yeah, and now we we're, we are today with the Enablement Team and uh, Mongoose. Yeah, yeah, so thanks, guys. So actually, I'm, I'm realizing now that we've known our, uh, known each other for going on about 10 years, which yeah. is uh, scary to me because I feel like I still just came out of uh, out of college. <laughs> you you used to be yeah, my support all, guy. <laughs> yeah, I know. We, we all used to look a lot younger. Aside from Caitlin, <laughs> we've all aged. <laughs> yeah, so it's interesting. You guys are, are uh, name-dropping Mongoose, right? But not everyone necessarily knows what Mongoose is. That's a specific product, but... I think it would be good to to maybe explore that a little bit. And uh, why don't you take a stab at really just kind of describing uh, at you know elevator pitch style what Mongoose is, what what does it deliver into companies, and what are the, what are the types of problems that you're trying to solve for here? So we can kind of get a baseline understanding of you know what Mongoose is and and what market it addresses. So Mongoose is a rapid application development framework. Um, its primary focus today is to help. Uh, internal development teams and citizen development teams uh, be able to leverage and deploy their solutions in a quick and economical manner. So internally within our company, there's about eight different uh, ERP products that are actually based on Mongoose. And the advantages for them and the problems we're trying to solve is uh, rapid deployment, rapid uh, implementation, rapid deployment, ease of maintenance, uh, the ability to uh, work both on-premise and in multi-tenant cloud in an effective manner. On the citizen development side, uh, what we want to bring is an, uh, a no-code, low-code type of approach for people that want to build out simple solutions, extend the logic of something that they've already purchased, and in a manner that allows them to upgrade without having to jump through hoops. 
Nice, great. Yeah, so so that brings us to an interesting point because Mongoose has been around for actually quite a long time, as long as Caitlin yeah. and I have been on this planet probably at this point. Just another little dick. Let's, let's really answer this. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, but what's interesting uh, is that obviously Mongoose predates uh, this this uh, trend of low code, no code development platforms. So, would you say that Mongoose uh, is that the sort of genesis? Is that how it started, or did it start its origin as a completely different uh, addressable market space, and it's kind of evolved into this? What are the overlaps between what Mongoose is doing today? to address that low code, no code space and how much of that is part of its origin story and, and the history of it? Or, or uh, is that sort of two different starting points that have been converging over the last you know, uh, decade? So if we go back on the history lesson of Mongoose, it evolved into it. So originally, uh, you have to go all the way back to a company called Simon, uh, which developed a product called Simex. Simex and Simon were progress-based, Unix-based uh, Unix -based ERP systems. Uh, when they got into progress in the GUI side, because it was a progress-based application, um, they realized that they wanted to evolve the product. They called it Sightline. Sightline, at its core, tried to be extensible with minimal upgrade problems. But being the type of uh, development platform it was on, we'd always run in the Roblox and there would always be that uh, version lock where people had made so many changes, it was almost impossible for them to upgrade without almost doing the re-implementation things. Um, at that point, front, uh, site, uh, Simex became Sightline. Sightline became Front Step. A lot of name changes. It was, it was the yes. early 90s. It was, it was the Wild West. So Front Step decided um, they were going to do some acquisitions, and they made some uh, some acquisitions, some really good, some really bad. But one of them was a uh, a product for warehouse management um, that also had its own type of platform or, or genesis of a platform that they used. the The product itself eh, was okay, but the genesis of the framework was was very very interesting. And there was a team of people that wanted to take that and use that to transform what was Sightline in progress over to this new framework. So they started doing the proof of concepts, going through it. Um, they had teams in Columbus, Ohio, uh, a lot of people in, uh, in Arizona doing the work. And the code name for the product was Rattlesnake because all the servers were in Arizona. So there was Rattlesnake and Cobra and all the different snakes that you could possibly think of. So they're building this framework. I'm a business partner at this point. I'm finding out that my product that I sell is now being transformed into something else. Okay, so we do some investigation, we listen to it. it sounds really exciting. Uh, we start getting involved, we start learning. And as the framework and the product are starting being developed, they've realized they wanna come up with a name for it. And Rattlesnake wasn't gonna cut it. And I, I, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> One of the executives came back and said, we're going to call this thing Rapid Object Oriented Internet Development System, ROIDS. Yeah. <laughs> so there's different ways to take that. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. no thanks, really thanks, everyone, for joining. <laughs> Just, sorry, Caitlin. <laughs> So they present this to the development manager, Doug Rudy, and Doug said, um, give us 30 minutes. We'll come up with something else. And they huddled together and they're like, there is no way we're calling this thing roids. <laughs> you know, the jokes were endless. The, the concern was even bigger. And uh, John Curry, one of our senior developers, was thinking around and he just goes, you know what? We're all sick of snakes. Mongoose is a really cool animal and it, it eats snakes. Why don't we call it mongoose? And they went back and pitched it 30 minutes later, and it stuck. Weirdest way to name anything. When I first heard Mongoose, I, was, I thought of bicycles. Uh, but the name stuck. It's unique, and it really does help identify us from the other platforms that are out there. So moving forward, we uh, Sightline gets ported over to Mongoose, and the time frame that it took was 14 months. So from 14 months, it was a progress-based application, completely ported all the progress code over to Mongoose in 14 months. That's incredible. But the reason it was able to do it is because of the metadata layer. 
and the inheritance model that was built as the foundation for Mongoose. Again, this was strictly for an ERP product. This had no thoughts of being a framework that was going to take over the cloud or be expensive from a, a generic standpoint. This was specific for this ERP. The advantage of this metadata framework, though, is not only the deployment, but when customers would extend the product. Uh, I like your form for item master, but I want to change it to something else. I want to add my own logic. I want to add new fields. I want to hide things. It allowed you to do it, but you could still upgrade moving forward because there was a, a methodology called form sync that would take the vendor level version of the form, your version of the form, the new version when an upgrade came, and do a three way diff and merge everything together. There were still some manual steps that came involved, but instead of it being a very expensive process, it became a very cheap process. So upgrades became manageable without losing your individuality from a customer perspective. So yeah, I'm, I'm a little curious. So, so it sounds a little bit like um, this is sort of uh, the scaffolding for ERP IP layering it on top, right? So sure. at this point we're in the protogenesis of what is Mongoose today, but this is really the core of the product and really what it was addressing, right? To, to your question, Mike, you know, where, where's the similarity to product today? Um, Dave has touched on one of the major points of this. Most systems that are out there today now are being built with a metadata based system. That is all of the componentry, et cetera, is stored inside of a database um, instead of compiled code. And this is the point back in, we're talking the late 90s, this product was already being built in that manner, right? And already being built in such a way that all of any type of personalizations or extensibility or anything that you do to the forms was all in an upgradable standpoint, an, an upgradable position, and it was stored into the database. That meant that all of these surrounding bits, whether it's the back end, the front end, et cetera, those could all be changed. But anyways, the, the point being that that metadata approach allows us, you know, we're, we were probably a Genesis product in, in, that, in that space um, versus a lot of products that today, that's where they start, right? So then uh, in terms of Caitlin, so uh, today, are, is it almost as if you're more designer developer rather than developer designer? Because you're, you're working on like a lot of projects with customers uh, doing proof of concept work and everything. So based on what Paul is saying, you know, these metadata driven approaches towards uh, creating applications and business value. Uh, what is it that you're actually doing, you know, when you actually engage on a product? A uh, project or a product or a capability or something like that. So, what, what does that workflow look like for you actually using these tools? Yeah, a lot of the times I'm taking uh, existing applications and literally just resurfacing them and making them. So, a lot of what I do is design. Um, it's rare that I have to drop into code and actually code things, and I can create, you know, an entire application without even dropping into code once. Um, so it's, it's kind of cool. Some of the stuff I do and I tell people I can build this out in, you know, a couple days worth of time. Um, and with zero lines of code, it's, it's crazy to me. Um, but yeah, I would say most of my stuff is really more design. That's pretty cool. So, I mean, you, you have a background in development itself, but at this point, it's almost as if that's sort of edge cases or corner cases where, yeah, you might not be able to achieve something with like a, a component that you can just drag and drop or tie to some sort of method or class, right? Mm -hmm. Our normal IDE that we utilize with Mongoose, you know, to us feels like low code, but we're going even further than that and taking that low code, no code approach to where it's literally just asking you questions and stepping you through the development of an app, of a form or a full fledged application without having to do any real, you know, traditional development with drag and drop and, and that type of thing. But uh, that's really the approach today. Yeah, like we can have a user literally step through our one of our wizards that, that we built and they don't ever have to, it'll create a table, it'll create an IDO, it'll create a form all in one wizard and they don't ever even have to go into design mode. It just steps them through the process. And so that alone, and then there you can also select from custom templates and you can literally pick how you want your form to look all using this wizard with these custom built templates that we have. So, yes, that's uh that's really cool because, you know, even, even a few years ago, like five, six years ago, I went to Penn state and I think um, there was a company Weebly. I don't know if, I think they're still around. I think maybe they were, there was an acquisition mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. uh, Weebly, even Squarespace today, it was that sort of 
evolution of what you see is what you get editing, except they they completely took it over to, you know, web page development, right? I'm a small business. I want to create like a little web shop front or my own personal page, but I don't know a single thing apart from what I want to to have as the page look like, right? So I want a banner here. I want a little bit of text in the bottom left. I want a little about me section and it could scaffold that out for you and generate all that code. So to your point, um, it's all metadata driven and it's about designing more than it is about coding over here. I think that's pretty interesting, but obviously in the consumer space, I, I see what the outcome is or what the benefit is, right? To It lowers that barrier to entry for people to be able to have personal sites for their business or, you know, for pleasure, whatever it might be in terms of the enterprise space and mongoose. So that's really, really cool. Caitlin, what, why is that valuable to customers though, that are running e big ERP implementations and platforms? Like when, when is a customer going to say, I really need a rapid application development platform and no code, low code solution for some reason, you know, how do, how do I wrap my mind around that? I, I can kind of step into this because selling this product uh, prior to joining. The reason it succeeds for the citizen developer comes in two stages. The first one is a product that is based on Mongoose. So when uh, a product like an ERP like Sightline goes out the door, the Mongoose framework comes along with it. That entire engine comes along with it. So it was used to develop Sightline. It's also used to do the citizen development. So that customer gets the benefit of being able to say, I like what I've got here 90%. It's an awesome application, but I need to make these business tweaks and I don't want it to interrupt my ability to stay current, to keep moving forward. So it's a very easy way for people to come in, make the changes that they want to check, they want to make and still evolve with the product as it grows. So that that's a it's a no brainer. And in fact, CSI, Sightline CSI, we've got all sorts of different names for these products. Um, they they will tell you the technology really aids in the sale of the product because that is a differentiator out there. A, a ready made industrial ERP application with that engine behind it gives that user so much flexibility and so much capability. And that's just on the product itself. Now you tie it in with the fact that it's part of InfoOS and it has pre-plumbing for the data lake, pre-plumbing for ION, pre-plumbing for all of the things that Info offers. And they, the user now has a, a wide net that they can really do things with without having to know all the technical ins and outs. Now for the customer that's using Mongoose that does not have an ERP based on it, because of that plumbing within 4OS, and I'll use multi-tenant cloud as a great example, they don't have to worry about how do I get access to the data lake? How do I get access to ION or ION API? They realize that with our wizards, I can just answer some questions, I'm now connected, and I can build things like homepage widgets, contextual applications that sit alongside the ERP. And again, they don't have to be technical experts. And I think this gets lost on the customers out there. They're not in the business of being programmers. They're manufacturing, they're doing distribution, they're doing uh, hotel management, whatever their business is, it's not the business of building software. Software needs to be an easy access to accentuate their business. And that's where the framework really brings the power to them. And probably just as important is when we start talking about development being rapid, there's also the implementation being rapid as well, right? Because there's not just the the point of building an application, but you also have to deliver it to the end users, train them, get the you know teach them how to make use of it. That that needs to be included as part of the full implementation sphere. So if you can develop something quickly, if you can de develop something with all of this technology already built into it, so that you don't have to go and build it from the ground up and think about security and and um, reporting and all those types of things, if it's built into the tool, then you can really spend more time doing the implementation of the tool and getting the most value out of it in, this, in the shortest amount of time. So if you're going to do that, you know, traditionally we try and make ERPs fit 80% of, of the need. Um, you have that 20% that you want to personalize or it needs to have some level of customization for the business. If you can fill that 20% in a short amount of time as part of the implementation of the software, you can really get some value, more value out of the software than you might have if you know it took 
two years potentially to build out that additional 20%. So you can recognize that that return on your investment quicker and definitely end up with a better uh, user experience and a better business decision analytics tool uh, with that as well. I think that's a good point, by the way, because that's that's another critical component, right? You know, a lot of this is also based on new workflows or new ways that people are actually starting to work. The pandemic is exacerbating that, but we've got for, for years, we've got mobile device workflows. We've got uh, uh, iPads, we've got laptops, we've got even TV screens for some of these types of things as well. So I think that's also a key area, right? So on, on the not just the outcome on the business side, it's also about usability, extensibility of, of the framework so that you can actually have it uh, dropped into a mobile setting and automatically rescale and resize everything dynamically, right? So there's there's a lot of value into having an application that can kind of do all that thinking for you to figure out what device am I being consumed on? How do I want to present this in, in the most ergonomic way, right? No, and that's where Caitlin uh, really spends a lot of her time uh, really working with different teams to make sure that we are Applications work one of two ways. It's, and you, and you brought it up, Mike, it's the user experience. What does it look like? How does it function, form, and, and everything else? And a lot of code designs focus so much on that. They also forget the more, the, the just important part, is it solving the business problem that we need? You know, it, it's, 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 it's the old mentality of, you need that foundation. It's like building a house. I can build the most beautiful home on the planet. But if I don't have a solid foundation, if I don't have plumbing, if I don't have the electrical run, it doesn't matter if I have the most beautiful dining room on the street. The house isn't going to stand up. It's not going to pass code. It's not going to work. So where Mongoose really comes into play is it handles both. And if you look at it, that reusability, that inheritance model, the things that we're talking about on the UX UI, we try to do the same thing at the data level. You want that same level of inheritance. You want to be able to build your data structures. You want to build your validation. You want to build your business logic in a manner that it can be reused regardless of the form or the page that it's working in. And if you can build that out and design that from the ground up, that's where Caitlin was talking about, you know, not dropping in the code. If you do that preparatory work ahead of time and you really think and leverage the framework as it's intended to work, the, we, we make the joke, how many lines of code can you build this application in? And I think Caitlin's one, I think she's actually built some complex ones that are zero. I mean, not dropping into any code from data all the way to UX. Uh, but Caitlin's work is, is very, very unique. And I'm going to hand it over to you in a second, Caitlin, is how she's working with the different teams to understand the needs from a look, a feel, whether it's got to be mobile, is it just strictly desktop? And she spends a tremendous amount of time with the teams, with our IDS team, making sure that we're putting uh, a good representation of what the company wants to represent. So Caitlin, I'll turn that over yeah. to you. Yeah, I mean, a perfect example of this is, you know, we built out a, um, a demo recently of they needed a they needed an application that was on their mobile device that they could walk around warehouses scanning items so they needed something that was portable obviously um and create these inventories of items and so that was kind of the business case and so what we did was we created a an application a mobile application that you know integrates seamlessly with uh in go so they can walk around warehouses just scanning items and creating these inventories and then whenever they get back to their computer, guess what? The same same application works on their computer. It just looks a little bit different. It's a little more high productivity. And um, that's all standard Mongoose. I mean, it's every form can be accessed through the mobile, through the web, and um, can be- How long did that take you? I mean, that only took a couple of days worth of work to, to build that application. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, well, I mean, the, the domain itself or the solution itself is really cool, but I think that's the point too, right? You could, yeah. you could also spend a lot of time developing code that does exactly what you just did over, you know, three or four development sprints, you know, just harnessing, you know, Java or .NET or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that's, that's like the takeaway there that it took you, what, three days, you said? Something like that, yeah. I mean, initially three I, days, and I don't think it was any code initially. 
I think there was zero code. I think it was all just standard mongoose. And I think the only code we had to add was for like the barcode reading, but we took advantage of that through uh, Infor Go. So we didn't even have to design a barcode reader. We just used the one that's built into Infor Go and just had it pass us the information, which uh, again, it's just leveraging the tech stack appropriately, right? Yeah, this stuff is so cool. I can't get enough of it. Like, honestly, it's only a, what, 40 some odd minute podcast. I mean, you know, we talk about this all the time, Paul, and I think we get carried away for like two hours at a time. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm, I'm kind of curious, just from an industry perspective, because there's like uh, 2020 is an exceptional year. Obviously, with the pandemic, everyone's, you know, we already work from home. We already worked from home. Uh, so, you know, there are certain things that the rest of the industry now has to support with an in, influx of well, <laughs> basically an exodus of office space uh, or people sitting behind a desk in an office. So, you know, Zoom has completely skyrocketed, right? Meet your horizon at this point. Even when someone says, I want to join a Teams meeting or a Google chat meeting or something like that, they're saying, oh, yeah, Zoom me. So it's become sort of like the Google of when you want to search for something on the Internet. But there are other trends that are also in the industry and even BBC. I mean, it's that's kind of peak saturation where, you know, headline news for a week straight on BBC.com is, you know, the future of productivity and development with low code and no code, code tools. I'm kind of curious, and, and I don't know if there's a right answer here, but I'm a little bit curious. You know, a lot of companies obviously see a shift of workloads to the cloud, either, you know, companies that are running their systems on-prem today, they're rushing to basically virtualize that, just using, you know, EC2 instances uh, and, and virtual boxes in their favorite cloud provider. Other companies that were already kind of into SaaS, they're just shifting more of their workloads into those virtualized products or SaaS-based products. But I'm kind of curious, do you guys see any sort of correlation or mapping between, you know, this rise of low code and no code? I mean, to some degree, it's being promoted from the analyst firms, but obviously with the pandemic and the shift in how people are working, are you guys seeing any sort of mapping correlation between, you know, the rise of low code tools and, you know, the kind of realization of what work looks like today this year yeah I think it I think it's grown it was growing before the pandemic um, it was definitely trending the terminology was starting to come out it was starting to show more importance but when the pandemic hit um, we saw as a corporation a huge uptick of our customers going to cloud as a result of it uh, in order to save their businesses and, and to kind of move forward what I've kind of noticed in the last three, four months of what this team has been doing is we're getting a lot more requests on the citizen development side. Uh, hey, we've got a customer. They're they're realizing they've got to do this because they're not bringing in consultants. They're not bringing in outside resources to do things as they traditionally would have done in the past. So the options are have them work remote or start empowering people within your organization to start doing these types of things. And we're starting to see more and more of these requests come in. So the, the pandemic has definitely influenced the citizen development uh, arm of the business. And as a result, being positioned where we are with Mongoose, uh, we're definitely seeing an uptick in those projects. The other day, Paul, was, he was laughing, he goes, I finally got off the phone. It was like my eighth customer that I just talked to today on a yet another project. And we haven't seen something like this in quite a long time. You know, we always get calls for that one key deal or, you know, we need this proof of concept for a sale. But these are active customers looking to leverage the technology to ease their burden. Yeah, that's actually an interesting perspective that I didn't really consider, right? I mean, everyone's looking at their P&L right now. So they're thinking about how to shave costs but still maintain high productivity or high development workflow or outputs. And I guess that that really supports very closely uh, the rise of these types of tools where it allows you to, to get the same matter or manner of output and new tooling, new capabilities, but also drastically reduces that that cost curve, right, of traditional development workflows and, and environments and tooling and everything. That's, uh, yeah, I hadn't considered that one before, but that's uh, that's an interesting one. But uh, I'm, I'm also curious, guys, as we, as we start to wrap it up here, you know, um, I... You know, I came from a customer once upon a time. Like I have a special place in my heart for for Mongoose as a platform. I, I used to do sightline development and everything back probably when it was more, you know, having to write a little bit more code than it is today. So I would have loved having the tools that that you guys have made today. But I'm kind of curious, you know, what are what are some of the more impactful projects that uh, that you kind of look back on your resume and say, like, 
wow, this completely blew me away. This was so much fun in terms of like what we actually produced for for a line of business. And I'm also kind of curious, have you guys seen anything just out of this world spectacular in terms of, you know, your product teams, right? So you give customers, you give people this this product and then they're, they go off running and then they're going to build something, right? And then they come back and they show you what they've built. Like, what is one of those spectacular moments where it was like, I can't believe that someone actually did this with something that we built here. There's oh, so, there's, yeah, there's so many, <laughs> so many, uh, you know, you, you, like you say, Mike, you give the tool to somebody and then you wait to see what they do with it. Right. And I'll you give you each one, Paul. I'll give you each one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I've seen everything from using it as a reporting tool alone, like, you know, doing backend reporting. I've seen them, people use it as a black box where they don't even use the front end. Um, they're literally just using the, the mid tier to, you know, do some processing that they want to do. So they're reading information through an API, doing some processing and punching it back in through an API layer. I've seen people that do things completely through a UI layer um, where they just want a beautiful look and feel for, you know, reimagining some business process that wasn't really sexy before and they want to, you know, add in a lot of functionality. Um, the product has so much capability to it that you'll just see everything across the board. You know, we've seen it run um, uh, SCADA uh, type operations to machines where we've done inter interactions with machines. That was really cool. Um, we've seen it uh, read information from machinery as well. You know, how many pieces per hour am I producing? And then punching that back into a uh, production schedule report and, and, you know, really trying to measure things real time out of machinery. We've seen that type of integration. Um, yeah, there's just so many ways that we've we've seen this utilized, but you'll always be surprised by the next thing, right? Because there's always something that you've never seen before, and somebody's usually trying to stretch the limits of things in order to make it work or you know apply it to something. But that's what we love, we and that's love when you normally the get the phone call. <laughs> that's when we get the phone call, yeah, because it's like, hey, how do you do this? Well, we've never done that before, but sure, let's try. And that's the fun part about it, because then it's a complete creative outlet that way. Um, it's really just trying to reimagine business processes in a, in a better, you know, more suitable way for the customer. So what about you, Caitlin? Any any projects that you like, you, if you just put all the other ones, you know, in a box and you never think about it again, is there one that just strikes you as, uh, as like this was either really cool to work on or... Uh, someone took something that you worked on with and they came back and they just completely like, wow, do you dazzle to you? That kind of thing. Uh, I think CRM is a great example. I mean, I came up with some initial wireframes for CRM and um, you know, they had like a really old school outdated kind of look and feel. And so I kind of gave them some stuff to run with. And when they came back to me with everything they had built, I mean, they had built, user like hundreds of user components what it looked like and it was it was amazing to see like how how updated it looked you know i think that's one of the things is when we hear back from we get something back from a customer and we, we show it to other people and they go that's mongoose <laughs> yeah we were just talking about that with uh, yard management services yes. right you guys yeah. gave mm -hmm. someone this platform and this baby and they grew it up into you know this handsome john ham of a product uh, that you would never recognize and be like, what can I say? <laughs> I figured you guys, yeah, he, look, you know, that's a separate, separate episode. Let's move on. But anyway, point is, uh, but yeah, I mean, I saw some of those screens and I was like, that's, that's Mongoose. That's the, the product that you guys created. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I think that you guys have a lot to be proud of, but there is no way that anyone would be able to point out the lineage or be like, you know, Oh wow! Like this is this is something that they scaffolded out, and like it was it was brilliant what they created. But um, but all possible through through a lot of that platform level feature, right? Right. Yep. That's pretty cool. Well, so thanks so much for joining, guys. I, I really do appreciate it, and and we'll have to find more time to uh, to do this again because, like I said, I mean we can go on for hours and hours, and I think Josh, we only have you booked for for the next uh, ten minutes or so, right? So. Uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up for the holiday season right now and uh, and call it uh, 2020 for, for Mongoose. But we'll have you back for, uh, for sure very, very soon. 
And for everyone that's listening in, you know, absolutely, again, uh, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, I'm sure we'll get an Instagram and a Twitter sometime soon. But, you know, listen to us on Spotify as well as anywhere else that you get your podcasts. And we look forward to uh, to joining up with uh, with our next round of guests and seeing you guys uh, at the Mongoose team pretty soon. So Great. thanks so much for joining. Right. Thanks, thanks for having us, Mike. All right. Thanks, guys. See you guys. Bye. Bye.